very much for joining us uh, for this debate and discussion this evening. I hope you can hear me loud and clear, even if you're in the overflow room. My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General here at the IEA, and it's my job uh, over the next hour or so to chair and facilitate this uh, debate. Before I give a very brief introduction to our speakers, a couple of housekeeping announcements. If you've got a mobile phone, a pager, an iPhone, anything that might make an irritating noise, if you could switch it off or to silent, I would be uh, very grateful indeed. Um, secondly, uh, in a once-in-a-lifetime deal, you will be able to purchase, if you haven't already, four uh, IEA publications about the European Union for just five pounds. Uh, two of them, I have to say, uh, have uh, question marks at the end of them. Better off out, question mark. Should Britain join the euro, question mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Europe after the no votes and uh, the ECB and the euro the first five years. And those are available uh, for five pounds for the four of them uh, on the table in the boardroom, which is on the right uh, as you can mm -hmm. um, Over the next few months, the IEA will be having a series of panel discussions looking at the economic aspects of Britain's place within the EU and indeed of the European Union itself. And the first of these is following the theme from an IEA monograph from just over 10 years ago, this monograph, Better Off Out, to look at the economic advantages and disadvantages of Britain's continued membership of the EU from the perspective of promoting a free market economy. And we have assembled a range of panellists uh, this evening, uh, all of whom I think it's fair to say have market-orientated views, but take radically different views uh, on uh, our membership of the European Union. Uh, so we're going to ask each of our panellists to speak for between five, or seven, uh, five and seven minutes. I'm not going to be too strict on that, but by about minute seven and a half, I'll start to ring this bell a little, and by about minute eight, I will start to ring it continuously. Um, and once we've heard from each of our panellists, there'll be plenty of time for uh, debate and questions. So allow me to introduce uh, each of them um, from uh, my left to my far left. Our first speaker will be Professor Tim Condon, Chief Executive of International Monetary Research and a leading member of the United Kingdom Independence Party. Uh, our second speaker will be Max Pearson, Director of Open Europe. Our third speaker will be Martin Howe QC of 8 New Square at Lincoln's Inn, who has done a considerable amount of work on uh, the arguments around a Bill of Rights and has published extensively on the European Union, constitutional matters and criminal justice. Our fourth speaker will be John Stevens, former Conservative uh, and pro-Euro Conservative member of the European Parliament. And our final speaker will be Gazella Stewart, who's been the Labour Member of Parliament for Birmingham Edgeston since 1997 and was one of the UK parliamentary representatives to the European Convention, a process that I think it's fair to say led her to becoming one of the more trenchant critics of the process. So uh, I hope you can join with me in welcoming our five exceptional panellists. Tim, if I can ask you to go first. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Can I first of all just to thank the Institute of Economic Affairs for organising this evening. Um, I suspect, Mark, that uh, you're going to be doing a lot of this in the next uh, two or three years, so um, I'm very flattered to, to be asked to. Uh... Now, um, um, I spent quite a lot of this year, um, summer months, and I kept to Christmas, but um, writing this, um, and um, I will quickly, in the next five or six minutes just to summarise the message. It's, and there are copies available at the back, and please take them away, um, because I don't want to take them back to that. They're, they're quite heavy. Um, how much does the European Union cost Britain? When I started this work, I was expecting an answer of about, between say, five and seven percent of GDP. Um, we know that there are the direct fiscal costs, the amounts that are paid mostly by the British government, not entirely, but mostly by the British government to the Commission and then around the European Union, some comes back, um, under the treaties. These are direct payments, um, they're available, published every year, in official documents, and so on. There's them, we know about that. I thought that 
they would only be part of the cost and that they'd be outweighed by the costs of regulation and other costs. But I have to tell you that I did not expect, when I started this piece of work, the answer I eventually came to. Um, and I want to make that point because the answer I came to happened to be a nice round number, it was 10% of GDP. Uh, and you might say, well, the UK Independence Party had to come up with a nice round number like that. Well, actually, I didn't plan to, and it really did come out of the analysis. The other costs of EU membership are the costs of regulation, the costs of resource misallocation, and then there are a variety of other damages and harms that are done to Britain because we belong to the European Union, rather more miscellaneous. And I didn't expect to come up with an answer of 10% of GDP, but that was the answer. The cost of regulation, just quickly go through that. I'm going to cheat a bit because I'm going to quote somebody and then move on. It's a much larger topic that I'm talking about. And Open Europe has done a lot of interesting and useful work on the topic, which I'd also recommend that you read. Peter Mandelson was about to become the EU Trade Commissioner in 2004. And he was speaking at the CBI conference, and he knew that there were some angry people in the audience having to cope with directives and regulations from the European Union. And so he said, this is Peter Mandelson, that EU red tape costs Britain 4% of GDP. Now look, since then, there's been, there have been many more directives and regulations, including, for example, the uh, directives and regulations relating to renewables, uh, environments, to uh, phasing out coal-fired coal power stations, and so on. And um, given that it was 4% then, I suggest it's quite a modest proposal that it's 5% of GDP now. There are other ways of arriving at a figure of this sort. I would simply refer you to the chapter that I have in, the excess, in, the, in this document. I am well aware that arriving at that number begs many questions, including the question of how regulated we would be outside the European Union. But nevertheless, that is the figure I came up with, and that's so. There is then the cost of resource misallocation. Now look, when we joined the European Union, well, common market as it was in those days, it was well known that we were going to be suffering from agricultural protectionism because of the common, common farm policy, common agricultural policy, AP. The OECD has estimated that the cost of this was 3 or 4% of GDP, this was some 20 years ago now, but that was the figure the OECD came up with then, all right? Now, the CAP probably costs less now, but um, because farming has declined in relative importance. Um, but I actually used some work that Patrick Minford had done um, under, may I say, some degree, IEA auspices some years ago, and he suggested that the costs of resource allocation were about 3% of GDP. When I started this work, I didn't know that. I hadn't read Patrick's work properly, I'm afraid. So we've got 5% of GDP, 3% of GDP. There's a whole mass of bits and pieces to do with, um, for example, and I'm going to be politically incorrect here, um, does Britain exist for the British or not? What's happened to employment in Britain since 2004 is that employment of British-born people has fallen and employment of foreign-born people has risen. Now look, I have nothing against foreigners at all. That's fine. I love going abroad and visiting the rest of and I, Okay. Nevertheless, it is true that people in Britain, British-born British citizens have had to cope with competition from foreign workers because of immigration. That is just a fact. And they, to a degree, have therefore been harmed. That harm needs to be quantified. Okay. That's the kind of thing that is part of this exercise, whether you like it or not. And then we come to the bit that's relatively uncontroversial, relatively, which is that we do make these payments to the European Union under the treaties they have risen over the years. They're rising at the moment because Tony Blair gave away part of uh, Lady Thatcher's rebate. Uh, they are now something like 1 to 1.2% of GDP gross. So the money comes back. There are parliamentary committees that, that repeatedly, under 
the governments of dif conservative and Labour governments repeatedly say this money is misspent, is not spent properly. If we repatriated that, it would be spent better. Anyway, the net cost is 0.7% of GDP or thereabouts. Gross cost, 1.2 thereabouts. In my view, the gross figure is actually more reliable. It's something at 1% of GDP. So 1% of GDP, pretty uncontroversial. About 250 pounds a head. Not 15 pounds a head, by the way, has been in, in the both the Telegraph, the Times, in the last few weeks. Um, about 250 pounds a head per annum. Uh, and um, that's clear cut. Uh, there's then the cost of regulation, the cost of resource allocation, the, the, the various miscellaneous bits and pieces which you can read about. And it is 10% of GDP. If we leave more jobs, more small businesses, lower taxes, lower electricity bills, lower water charges, we would be better off. Thank you. Tim, many thanks in particular for being <coughs> one minute under time for, for rarity for speakers at OEA events. Uh, Max, follow that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks, Mark, for the invitation and to IEA for um, hosting this event. I see a lot of familiar faces uh, in the audience uh, and uh, had this debate a few times with a few of you. Um, you will know who you are. Uh, and, uh, but I always welcome the opportunity. Now, Tim, I must give you credit for having. Uh, you know, had the courage to actually dig into uh, something which has eluded academics and thinkers uh, for, for a very long time. Um, so I congratulate you on, on, uh, on a uh, heroic effort. Um, I do have some problems with your study, uh, which I don't want to go into, but um, I've studied the cost of regulation myself in, in far too much detail uh, for my own health and well-being. Um, and we have started, worked a lot with, for example, the government's, uh, as you know, the uh, UK government's impact assessments. And we have a quite impressive database in the Open Europe, uh, um, at Open Europe, uh, containing 2,300 UK government impact assessments. Mm -hmm. And uh, having read through a lot of them, a lot of them have uh, probably made my life slightly shorter. Um, so it is a quite difficult task. And I, I uh, although I do have some problems with some of your uh, figures, which I can discuss perhaps in Q and A, I do think it's a useful exercise nonetheless. Um, I do not agree with your sentiment, however, that the UK, uh, UK is uh, UK should leave the EU, um, and I will tell you why very briefly. Um, at the moment, there is a bit of a, I suppose, for lack of better expression, unholy alliance here in Britain between those who want Britain to withdraw uh, and those who want the status quo to prevail. Um, both make. I suppose legitimate points, uh, but both also say that renegotiation in Europe is impossible, but for, very, for two very different reasons. One, because they want the status quo to prevail, the other because they see as uh, the only feasible option Britain withdrawing altogether. Um, it's a bit, as I've said in the past, it's a bit like sort of the Baptist and bootleggers uh, coalition in America during the prohibition. Uh, both wanted to keep the prohibition, but for very different reasons. One <laughs> wanted to sort of cite a religious conviction, the other, the other one uh, uh, had a sort of a more com commercial conviction that uh, was, was driven. I don't know which group is which here, but uh, you get where I'm going with that. Um, and I think that's roughly where we're at at the moment. Um, I think both groups, broadly speaking, get it wrong, but I would say I share more frustration, more of the frustration with the withdrawalist group than with the status quo group. In other words, I think uh, there are more uh, faults with the EU than what uh, those who want the status quo to prevail uh, want to admit. Um, and I have more sympathy in the basic analysis of where the EU goes wrong um, uh, with the withdrawalist group. But I would say the following to the, the withdrawalists here. Um, I've yet to meet somebody, and I will be a bit provocative, that can tell me exactly what happens on day two when Britain, when Britain withdraws. In other words, what exactly do you want instead of the current arrangement? And I will offer the following. I think to say that Britain should become like Norway is a major own goal. Um, if you, whatever you use, do not use the Norwegian model. Uh, because Norway is effectively not in the EU, but run by the EU. Yeah. Uh, it's not something I'm saying just to sort of repeat cliches, but it's actually the truth. Norway is 75% an EU member. It's just what it is. Um, it works for Norway because it gets a very specific trade-off. It gets fisheries and farming, um, 
which helps Nor because it helps the Norwegians to uh, maintain their heritage. And to, for, for a Swede, you know that the uh, concept of Norwegian history ended in 1905. Um, when Norway, Norway got the, that, that joke usually go down, goes down well when you have a certain concept of Scandinavian history, but I can tell the audience here didn't quite appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, the, uh, but in any case, it works for Norway because it does help them to maintain what is effectively quite important rural heritage, and it also helps Norway because Norway does have quite a niche position in, 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 the, in the European economy in that they have oil, and most of the exports are in the form of... Um, uh, raw products such as fish oil. Now, if you translate this model to, to the UK, it will be the worst of all possible worlds. Norway is a full member of the single market but would have absolutely no votes on EU legislation. Again, it works for Norway because it has a different position. <coughs> Applied to Britain, it will mean that, for example, the bulk of regulation governing the City of London and UK financial services, which accounts for roughly 11% of UK GDP, and a huge amount of tax revenue every year, Used to. would not be uh, subject to any UK influence. I mean, it wouldn't. In return, Britain would get control of fishing and farming, which accounts for 0.7% of UK wide GDP. Now, the EU policies covering fishing and farming are absolutely maddening. I mean, they are crazy policies. But would a trade-off be worth it? The Swiss model is slightly different, but there you would have to nego negotiate separate single market access, which is not guaranteed. I mean, I agree to the Swiss model, but the point is there's no custom-made uh, alternative to full EU membership that works for Britain. And those of you who want Britain to withdraw need to come up with one that is convincing in order for you to win your case. But I will say equally to those of you who want the status quo to prevail or who even are daring enough uh, to suggest that Britain should sign up to more Euros integration, which, by the way, may uh, may cause you to lose your British passports, the way things are going. Um, I will say to you that your that is not an option either. The status quo in Europe is not an option. It's not on the table. Whatever happens to the euro, whether it breaks up or whether it integrates further, Europe will change. So Britain cannot remain a member of what we see in front of us at the moment. It will have to choose to be a member of something differently. And what most likely will happen, absent the Eurozone breakup, is that there will be more integration in the Eurozone, in the banking sector and potentially in the fiscal sector, which will have implications on Britain. Now the question is, what does the UK do in this kind of situation? Does it just sort of go along with the ride and accept, for example, that the Eurozone 17 starts writing the banking rules for all 27 member states and become like Norway anyway, because that's what banking union could potentially imply. Or does it take active steps to make its membership more sustainable? And I think it should do the latter, and that's where a negotiation comes into the picture. I think there is fully possible for Britain to get the new set of membership terms that better reflect both economic realities and democratic realities in the UK and across Europe. Um, and I mean that's what we have been looking at quite a bit. Um, and here's the bell uh, when I get to the exciting part. Um, <laughs> uh, took a while. Um, I will say just two points on that. And I know there are some people here that will say it's absolutely impossible to renegotiate. And I will say it's. It, I always found that actually an absolutely curious position because it's almost a saying that finally uh, Hegel has has been right. We have discovered the end of history. The EU is the only entity in world history that will perpetually move in one direction only. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's really giving the EU founding fathers a lot of credit, don't you think? <laughs> of course the EU can be changed. Of course you can renegotiate uh, this structure. It has happened many times in history and it will happen again. The second thing I would say, uh, and this is where I can imagine a lot being a lot of uh, um, um, disagreements in the room, but the second thing I would say, if the choice is between Britain leaving the EU altogether or Britain getting new membership terms, then I bet you that a lot of very powerful uh, EU states will go for new membership terms. Because imagine Berlin, Stockholm, Helsinki, Copenhagen being left in the EU uh, where the center of gravity has moved so much in the direction of what could be perceived, rightly or wrongly, as a inflation-prone protectionist Mediterranean bloc. Uh, Britain is needed in there. And beyond the posturing and, and rhetoric coming out of continental Europe at the moment, a lot of national capitals will uh, give 
UK concessions if the choice is binary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, well um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I was uh, very pleased to notice that uh, amongst the four pamphlets offered for sale tonight uh, is this one called Better Off Out? Um, now, in the interests of fair trading, I think it should be made clear that this is not a recent publication. In fact, uh, I think it's uh, ten years or more old. Um, and the statistics in it and the conclusions in it are therefore not quite up to date. Oh, no, I don't know. That's why they're sec all failed. Second edition, 2001, 11 years. Um, this uh, pamphlet uh, was written um, by the late Brian Hindley uh, and myself. And uh, I can say uh, that uh, since I, I'm not an economist, um, that my contribution to it was limited to an analysis of the treaty structures and alternative treaty structures um, of the uh, what would happen if we're in, what would happen if we're out, and various scenarios, um, and that the, the economic work uh, and the conclusions in it were all done by Brian. And the uh, conclusion that we came to, I say we came to, in fact, the conclusion more accurately, say Brian came to, uh, overall, having done the uh, economic analysis, uh, was that the that time, the pros and cons, the economic pros and cons of membership of the European Union were fairly evenly balanced. Uh, and therefore, the question of whether it was a good idea to remain a member of it was essentially a political one rather than an economic one. Now, since that time, it, it is quite clear that whatever the balance was then, the balance has moved adversely uh, to uh, membership from the point of view of this country. Uh, the Eurozone has turned into a car crash economically, uh, the benefits of being associated with a, a, a declining economic part of the world so closely are clearly less than with a growing part of the world, uh, and uh, a, another very serious political problem which uh, Matz has adverted to uh, is that this is leading to the Eurozone clustering together uh, and potentially using the voting mechanisms, qualified voting mechanisms of the European Union structure in a way which is adverse to this country, and specifically adverse to the City of London uh, and its status as a world financial centre. So it's not a surprise that many people are now asking, uh, uh, actively looking for ways in, in which to recast our relationship with the European Union in some way or other. And uh, there are two questions which arise, uh, each of which are, are, require a lot of thought. One is what type of relationship we would like the European Union, uh, ideally, if we could have it. And the second question, which you can't totally divorce from the first, is assuming we work out an ideal relationship we would want, how do we get there? How do we negotiate our way to achieving such a relationship in reality? We can't impose a particular relationship on our partners. Now, leaving the European Union legally is an extremely simple step. Um, all we do is we send a letter to the uh, President of the European Council under Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union inserted by Lisbon saying we want to withdraw and two years later we cease to be a member of the European Union. That article uh, also provides for the negotiation of uh, transitional arrangements and of a continuing uh, uh, relationship with the European Union but of course there is no guarantee uh, that uh, any uh, relationship offered to us would necessarily be desirable or acceptable. So a unilateral uh, withdrawal step, although legally easy, uh, does lead us, uh, we, we should, really shouldn't do it unless we're convinced that being out and just having a, an external WTO type, type trading relationship with continental Europe is what we want to achieve. So they're then looking beyond that, two basic choices about the kind of revised relationship one could negotiate. Uh, and I, I think that two ends of the spectrum one is to take the existing treaty relationship uh, and, and try to chop bits out of it, repatriate aspects of it, put in opt-outs on various areas. The other is to look at it from the other end uh, of the telescope, as it were, and you start from a zero relationship, what would happen if we press the button and leave, and then say, well, what do we want to build back on from that in order to... Uh, uh, 
uh, preserve trade relationships and uh, to benefit both us and the uh, other members of the European Union. Now, uh, uh, in our, my seven minutes, I can't um, go into a great long screed on these, but choice one, opting out of bits, I think suffers from very serious problems indeed. Basically, opt-outs do not work. Uh, history shows us that. Um, actually, to be fair, the Monetary Union opt-out has worked. <laughs> so, a very important one. Um, but, but beyond that, um, uh, the, the social chapter opt-out uh, failed because it was circumvented uh, by the use of legislation. For example, uh, uh, working time directive was dressed up as a health and safety measure forced through by QNB uh, instead of being a social measure. Uh, and that uh, uh, misuse of the treaty was upheld by the uh, impartial umpire, the European <laughs> Court of Justice. Uh, and um, we, uh, e even if we were to achieve opt-outs in a number of specific areas, we would still be standing still on an upward-moving escalator. I think the word status quo are probably not quite right because it isn't a status with the membership of the European Union. If no further treaty changes are made, still the process of further regulations passed through under qualified majority voting would happen. The process of a reinterpretation of the treaty uh, by the Court of Justice would continue. Only recently, well, 21st of December, one of the silliest decisions of that court will come into effect um, when it will be compulsory for the insurance premiums charged to male and female young drivers to be identical, even though the uh, risk of accidents of young male drivers is something like eight times higher than that of young female drivers. And it's interesting to see how that happened. Uh, we negotiated into the insurance, uh, in, into the um, Sex Quality Services Directive, a specific opt out relating to uh, insurance premiums that, if they're statistically justified, uh, to charge the different sexes different amounts. Uh, we, or well, actually any member state, was entitled to do so. What happened when this came before the European Court? It said, oh, this is fundamentally contrary to the uh, Charter. Uh, EU Charter uh, of Fundamental Rights, and we're going to cross it out of the directive. So the deal that was done when the directive was negotiated has been negated by judicial action um, of, of this kind. Now, all that, thing will that kind of thing will continue to happen. Now, the single market. Lots of people say, oh, we love the single market. We want to have the single market and, and nothing else. Well, I say the single market contains the heart of the problem. And what you have to appreciate is the single market is actually divide, you can divide it conceptually into two aspects. One is a set of free trading rules, the free movement of persons, services, uh, uh, goods and capital. Um, uh, rules against discrimination and against blocking the movement uh, of, of, of all these things. Uh, and the other part of it though, which is a very important, more important part of it really, uh, is regulatory harmonisation. Oh, we can't have a, a level playing field unless everything's absolutely identical all over the playing field. And that is the Achilles heel. That regulatory harmonisation route, because it implies qualified majority voting, therefore the potential imposition of regulations on us that we don't like, uh, is the heart of the problem. I won't talk about the economic cost of it, but uh, of course you've already mentioned that. I, I, I don't want to enter into the economic territory. Uh, but um, uh, uh, I view it as a very serious cost in terms of, an, of a, a, a gross restriction on the ability of our country to set our own laws in accordance with our own democratic wishes uh, over huge fields. So uh, I would argue that getting rid of that aspect of the single market is an essential part of what we should aim for in any recasting of our relationship. Uh, if we don't do that, um, we, we are still in an unstable situation where we're being pushed forwards down the path of European integration that we don't want to get, go along with. Uh, now, I agree with Max that um, Norway's relationship would be absolutely useless for this country, uh, and indeed the heart of it is that Norway is effectively bound to comply with a single market regulatory uh, structure while having no vote at all in, in formulating them. In fact, they have a theoretical right 
um, under the EEA agreement to say we're not implementing the directive. If that happens, however, uh, the sector concerned falls outside the scope of the free trade arrangements between Norway and the European Union. Uh, so I, I think that's probably a, a model of a kind of relationship we would not want to have, um, and uh, a, 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 a relationship that we would want to have should be one which encompasses single market free movement rules, uh, but gets rid of the regulatory structure and gets rid of the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice over this country for good. Now, having said that as one <coughs> objective, the question of how we get there is not without its difficulties. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd just like to make one comment about that, because some people go around as saying, uh, as if the process of renegotiating a relationship with the European Union, uh, which has lasted since 1973, uh, is a matter of you know, rushing in, banging the table, having a few weeks of negotiations and coming out uh, with, here our demands, here we are, here's a renegotiated relationship. It is not. It is a much more long-term exercise than that. And it should be analysed not just in terms of, oh, well, what do we get out of it? What do we want? What we have to say, what, what, what we as a country have to say is, well, what are the benefits uh, of this relationship, not only to us as a country, but to our partners who will continue to be our trading partners? How do they benefit out of it? How can, how can we convince them that they stand to gain out uh, from a revised relationship with us just as much as we do. And, and in my view, that is the heart of, of the problem that needs to be addressed when it comes to what we should negotiate and how we should get there. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you. John Stevens. Thank you, Mark, for, for inviting me. I think the problem with this debate is that we're not really quite sure um, what Europe we are talking about when we're discussing leaving it. Because as Matt has already said, um, the European Union is going through a tremendous change at the moment. And it is, in effect, um, on the way, probably, to becoming <coughs> the Eurozone plus. And so the issue is not a status quo, our present relationship, in which we're not in the Euro, we're not in Schengen, um, and leaving. It is what will be the much tighter, probably, European Union that we will be facing in a few years, and um, leaving. And I think the problem here is that uh, Britain's relationship has always been reactive to the European Union. We didn't join at the beginning. We then thought we needed to join. So we joined late um, on poor terms. And it would be nice to try and get ahead of the game. And so what we're really discussing here, it seems to me, is whether we think the euro is going to survive and whether it's going to work and what we mean by that. Because if you think the euro is going to fail, and I would imagine that most people in this room probably think the euro is going to fail, you shouldn't worry. You should relax. Wait. You get a much better terms and conditions. The problem comes is if you think it's going to work. Because if you think it's going to work, then the issue is, from a trading point of view, is do you try and get ahead of the game and anticipate that? Or do you wait for it to work, in which case, clearly, your negotiating position is going to be a hell of a lot weaker. And all of this is particularly true when we're discussing the city of London. If you think the banking union is not going to happen, the Germans aren't going to do it, the Italians can blow up, whatever, then you needn't worry. But I think people are worried, and I think they're right to be worried. <coughs> so another way of looking at this is to say, we've been talking about, well, would we be like Norway, would we not be like Switzerland, or whatever. Um, I suppose the real question from the point of view of a, someone like me, who is in favor of her being in the European Union, is you've got to ask ourselves, why are we not? like Germany or France. What makes Britain so different from Germany or France or the Netherlands or Italy or Spain? Why shouldn't we be right in? Because that's the real issue, it seems to me. The issue is whether we're right in or right out. Why shouldn't we be in the Euro? Why shouldn't we be in Schengen? That's the real choice. 
And that's what you've got to consider. What are the things that make Britain so different from countries which are very close to us, which have historically been very tied to us, which have got very similar economies? We have a strange situation. We have a government that's telling us we should be much more like the Germans, more manufacturing, all the rest, that we need to trade more with a wider world, which the Germans do. Being in the EU has not prevented the Germans being the top exporter to China. Being in the EU has not inhibited the German Mittelstand. So what is it that you are really worried about? What makes Britain so different? That's the answer I would like to hear from those who say we should leave. But I'd like to try and um, give this a little bit of a twist in favour of the IEA. Um, <laughs> because I have supported them. I supported the creation of the euro. I would agree that the opt-out of the euro has worked, but principally because the euro was set up without the banking union and the architecture that is now coming and which is now posing the fundamental issue for us of whether we should be in it or not. So in a sense, it's a delayed moment of truth. But why, what was the euro about? What is the euro about? It is an attempt to create a monetarist instrument for transforming the competitivity of the European economy. That's what it's about. It's about solving the problem, which is, it can be defined very simply. That the, Euro, the Eurozone has got a population somewhat larger than that of the United States, not much, and it's got a GDP somewhat less than the United States, not much. Broadly comparable. And yet it's quite obvious, all the problems that you have inside the Eurozone, language, regulation, you know, differences of culture, lazy Greeks, or whatever you're talking about. Um, and, and it's not, so if one could remove even some of this, I mean, if you get the Greeks to pay tax and the Italians to borrow less and um, the Spanish to export more or whatever, if you could get all of that, then the uptick in performance, the up side in performance for that Eurozone, relative to America, is enormous. And that's where the hidden growth really is in this argument. It's about a ruthless rationalization of the European economy, driven by monetarism. It is, in fact, a rather Thatcherite idea. And traveling around, as I have this summer, to Greece and to Spain and to Italy and to Portugal and to Ireland, I am reminded tremendously of the early 80s in Britain. Debates about the enemy within, which you're getting in Greece now, tax evaders, corrupt politicians. This is all extremely good news, provided you don't break the whole system, which was exactly what we were thinking in the early 80s. You put a real squeeze on. I think the Germans actually know what they're doing here. Now, you may think they're going to fail because the Greeks are too lazy and the Italians are too hopeless or whatever. You may think that. And if you think that, you've got nothing to worry about because this whole thing's going to fall apart, and you're going to have a much looser order, which you'll be able to negotiate it. But if it works, then Britain has a major problem, and one quite fast, particularly for the city. Particularly for the city, because you can't be half in a banking union. And the idea that we can go on trading 40% of euro-denominated instruments outside, not being in the euro, is fantastic. Completely fantastic. Now, you may need another, the city needs another business model, certainly, after the crisis that we've had. And the clear trend away from offshoring and uh, all the rest that, that is, and a greater international regulation that is clearly <coughs> So I just come back to the point. I think we've got a moment of truth coming for Britain. The choice is not can we negotiate some sort of halfway house. Um, that is going to be extreme. I mean, I'm not saying that from having withdrawn, you would not cut a, a, a range of trading deals. But then you've got to ask yourself, what is it that makes Britain so different from Germany and France? What is it that means that we cannot be part of it? And you've also got to ask yourself, is it really right to be, to be cutting ourselves off from a process which, if it is successful, will represent an enormous success for essentially a monetarist free trade agenda run by a 
a central bank that is not actually printing money on an enormous scale, which is actually bringing bearing down on deficits, which is going to create a structure that is, we would believe here, good IEA principles, are, is the essential architecture of prosperity. And the notion that there's going to be more growth in the rest of the world means, I mean, that is as true for Germany and France and everything else. If you, unless we've got a solid monetarist base to operate from, all hopes of trading around the world with emerging markets and things is, is not worth anything. That's what's at stake. Thank you. Get you another worry that Lord Lamont's clicking up the pen will make him break it any moment. <laughs> <laughs> and can I sort of try and explain as a good German as to why we're not like the Germans? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite interesting to actually pick up on that. But I, I want to start off with by thanking the A because uh, there's an element of. of, of things coming full circle. I came to this country uh, during the three-day week uh, and I was selling economic books in Manchester and German academics would come over to England and want publications on the British crisis uh, and nobody in Britain thought there was a crisis. The fact that we're switching off lights for three days a week was kind of one of those ca casual irritants and I seem to remember it was IE publications which were the first ones which actually started an analysis of what was going wrong here. Uh, but that's also the time when uh, I want to start off by sort of why, why we are different and why, you know, John's model, why it's a very nice idea, isn't going to work. First thing is I have no problem with federalism. Uh, I grew up in a federal state. Uh, I'm a Bavarian, which is even a, a combination of the, the, the Swabians, the Bavarians and the Franconians. Works perfectly well, but I do understand what a demos is. And the real answer as to why this isn't going to work isn't because... Uh, is a willingness or an unwillingness, is why can't we be the United States of Europe? To which there's a very simple answer, and it's called 2,000 years of history. Uh, if you have a state that is actually growing, uh, and an economy, and it's, it's forging an identity, then that's fine. Uh, but we rather bizarrely ended up after World War II, with the exception of the Balkans, with the nation states in a configuration which was pretty much functioning. Uh, and if, if, if any of sort of want to really look at where I think the problems are, uh, I recommend to you an article by Anthony Beaver, uh, he of the uh, Spanish Civil War and um, what were the other ones? Stalingrad and, and, and Berlin, in, in last month's standpoint, where he uses a phrase which was used by East Russian refugees, and they said, I can hear the ice cracking as they were leaving and crossing the Baltic. Uh, and that's where, how I feel about Europe at the moment. I hear the ice cracking. I, I think, in a sense, our debates are completely meaningless because something's going to happen out there, irrespective of what we want to happen. And it's not a British problem. This is the other, this is the bizarreness of this debate. We keep thinking it's about these islands and the rest of Europe. No, it isn't. The ice is cracking all across Europe. And it will be between those countries who are solvent members of the Eurozone, who will have a choice whether they do want deeper political integration. Uh, and those who are not solvent or are not members of the Eurozone, and the only ones who've got an upside is us and the Danes, the sweet sort of living in sin, uh, and there's quite a number of them who are under an obligation to actually join. Yeah, but it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Always much more fun. Um, and the, 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 the question within Europe will be, what are the kind of relationships which we wish to have with our neighbours? And to me, the really big... Uh, event of 1973 when the United Kingdom joined, it actually deprived every other small country within Europe of a choice how it wished to relate to its neighbours, whether it wished an economic relationship or a deeper political integration. And then we ended up with a, with a model which would have been perfectly possible to run with the original six and throw a few more in. You know, the Austrians, the kind, you know, you, you could have had that deep political integration and potentially create a demos which may have slightly overcome the problem. But the, the current structure is just too big. There is no 27-country demos. And again, the Brits ought to understand this much more than, you know, we tend to forget that actually we are some kind of a federal state. The United Kingdom, there is not a single London taxpayer who will say, how dare you use my taxes to bail out Northern Ireland? 
Uh, we all know that, that this proportion of the, per pound of taxes paid benefits of the United Kingdom go more to Northern Ireland and then to Scotland and Wales than they would do the South East because there is a sense of who we are. And, and to me, it, the, the real test is if, if you want the political structure to hang together, you've got to be able to close your eyes and say we and know who you mean. And if you can't do that, then you've got a problem. And that takes me to, to, to John's idea of that this is the, 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 the great Thatcherite uh, competitive market. Well, it is not competing within itself because it, whenever it, it faces a problem, it regards doing the same everywhere as being the right thing to do. Now, when I go back to Birmingham, uh, I will go back to a city that has, and, and this is true, 22% of that city is under the age of 15. Uh, a third of the city is under the age of 24. Uh, also, the majority of my primary schools will have more than 25 languages as their first languages other than English. This is a kind of, on the one hand, extraordinary chance to, 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 to kind of economic growth. Uh, but you need to have a kind of respect for diversity and give opportunities. And the European Union simply does not want to wish to tolerate it. It mistakes compliance costs and reducing the number of compliance costs across the Union with making everything the same. And that's why I think Britain is facing a difficulty in a sense which none of the politicians will face up to. I would suggest, and the politicians in this room can, can, can try and challenge me, is that the vast majority of politicians actually don't understand you. Uh, I spent two years teaching European Union law. I spent two years as a minister sitting in council meetings. I then spent two years negotiating European Union level. If I understand the political dynamics of what goes on, of about a fifth of it, I think I'm having a good day. <laughs> uh, because the politicians kind of, the, the, the time scale in which the decisions are being made are completely out of sync. There is no delete button. There's no commission proposal which ever goes away, which is the kind of thing we are, we are used to. We negotiate in chimneys. You know, whereas once you're in Brussels, they say, you know, we trade in the working time directive on paternity rights if you give us a bit of fisheries and then you throw throwing a bit of home, justice and home affairs into the bar. But Westminster or none of the national capitals can actually deal with that kind of negotiation that goes on. And that takes you back to the real fundamental problem, and it actually is a democratic one. Uh, and this is where I think that this will really come and bite us. And this is where, what should Britain do at this stage? Uh, I think the whole debate of should we have a referendum in or out is completely meaningless. Because what, what are the options which we, what is we, the choice we're giving people? And even this debate about are we Switzerland, are we Norway is completely meaningless. We are not Switzerland. We are not Norway. We are the sixth largest economy in, in you know, we, we are a member of the United, we are P5 member, we are nuclear power. We are not those countries. So it does require a a thinking of a different kind of relationship. And Matt is quite right to challenge us to think about it. Where I think he's not right is at this stage to expect the, 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 the puzzle to be completed. But there's some kind of fundamental thinking that has to start to go on at uh, government level. And my big criticism is that there is no such thinking going on. It required Simon Wolfson to, to, to have the Wolfson Prize for someone to seriously think about what would be the alternative to the single currency? How would you leave? Government ought to be doing that. I think it is a massive, massive application of a government of whatever political shade of view to not start to produce some of the options, not to start thinking what would happen. And now we are in, we're in the December now. What's going to happen uh, if uh, Angela Merkel, who will not do anything until she's got the German election, to to, to anything about Greece? Uh, so you know. Provided the market's letters, we're kind of fairly safe until September 2013. But after that, what's going to happen when we've suddenly got 500,000 British tourists in, in, stranded in Greece uh, and you will have an ex exit of one of the insolvent Euro countries? There is no planning, no thinking going on. So rather than saying, should we be in or out, I think Britain needs to start thinking about, A, can it hold its own union together? Do not take the Scottish referendum for granted. Uh, the, it, for those of you who may have noticed, there is one in 2014, and Alex Salmon is one of the shrewdest politicians I've ever come across. I think he's utterly misguided, but don't take it for granted as yet. And then we need to start thinking, if we do not want a deep political union, which is, I think even if the polit politicians desired it, I think our people would not go with us. We couldn't create the demos. 
then it has to start thinking about an alternative. And it has to say, and I think Martin is quite right when he sort of knocks this idea that you can just have you know, a single market on its own would be all right. But we need to start thinking what bits of the single market would be the things of a relationship. Because a bit by bit negotiating won't work. The whole structure is so interwoven that you simply cannot extract some of the, 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 the bits and pieces. It, it was designed that way. It was designed to link you in. So, so my urge is rather than arguing, should we be in, should we be out, I think the politicians and with the help of people in industry need to start thinking what are the kind of models that are, are out there. And then at some stage we will have to ask the British people as to what kind of relationship they want, but they need to be given alternatives. And this is not a British problem. There will be a number of other countries who have to start to do the same kind of thinking. And they're actually looking towards us to give them some kind of leadership. And I think we have to start giving it to them.